I actually think when it comes to subpoena compliance, we should follow the Jim Jordan standard. So this is our chairman, hauling all us here, everyone here today, people at the Department of Justice, the Department of Education who are doing important work to claim they are out of compliance when he himself is currently out of compliance. You don't have any uh, transcriptions of their interviews? We have the first one and we have the dozens who come and talk to our office. Uh, they talk to your office privately? They talk to Republican staff, right. And they're not transcribed, no notes, no nothing? The first one happened Tuesday. No, no, I'm not talking about the first one. The first one, one happened Tuesday, dozens. the next one happens tomorrow, the third one happens next Wednesday, and we'll continue to do that. You just said dozens. You, an FBI whistleblower. Another FBI whistleblower. Another FBI whistleblower. Another FBI whistleblower. An FBI whistleblower. Another FBI whistleblower. Another FBI whistleblower. Dozens and dozens of whistleblowers. Well, we're doing it the way we're supposed to do it, Mr. Goldman. No, you're supposed to turn it over to the minority. When they, when they, ha when they come and testify, you'll, you'll have access to the transcript like everyone on the committee will. You mean your staff is not going to turn it over to our staff? We're just in the dark? Jim Jordan's obstruction of justice committees that he's overseen have less cre credibility today than they did when we convened just three weeks ago. The other day, Jim Jordan was asked, well, what do you think of the former president who put out on Truth Social the other day, essentially another call to action, a January 6th-like post, when the former president said this posting. Jim Jordan was presented with this post by the former president that calls for death and destruction. And Mr. Jordan said that he would need his glasses. He was looking the other way. Jim Jordan, looking the other way. You got a politician who does certain things. Those actions then benefit his family financially. And then there's an effort to conceal it and sweep it under the rug. The impeachment power, as the chairman said, is a power that solely resides in the House. When you have a majority of the House of Representatives go on record, that sends a message. We think we get timely participation from the witnesses we need to talk to and the documents Mr. Comer has been seeking. Finally, I would say this about this changing story from the White House, this changing story from the Justice Department. Today, Hunter Biden did a press conference. He was supposed to be in a deposition. He did a press conference. And at that press conference, he said, my father was not financially involved in the business. Well, that's an important qualifier. We haven't heard that. For three years, we haven't heard that. All we've heard is Joe Biden had no involvement. Now his son does a press conference when he's supposed to be being deposed and says he wasn't financially involved. Well, what involvement was it? Every conspiracy theory we just heard has been debunked, not true, and distorted from the facts. Because this impeachment inquiry is political vengeance directed by a twice impeached, four times indicted president, and carried out by extreme MAGA Republicans. Are, are you serious that Jim Jordan, a witness to one of the greatest crimes ever committed in America, a crime where more prosecutions have occurred than any crime committed in America, refuses to help his country, and we're gonna get lectured about subpoena compliance and contempt of Congress? Jim Jordan won't even honor a lawful subpoena? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Many people in the Jewish community asked the chairman, Chairman Jordan, to take this down. And it wasn't just members of Congress. It was nonpartisan Jewish organizations who said, Kanye West is anti-Semitic. I don't know what you're doing, but please do not give him a platform by leaving this tweet up. It stayed up for months, defiantly. This committee should have a conversation and a hearing about anti-Semitism. But I would first insist that the chairman, I don't know why he put this tweet up. Either he believes it, which I hope is not the case, or he just wanted to own the libs. And if that's what you're doing, you're hurting a lot of people by keeping that tweet up for so long, especially knowing what it represents. And this entire Congress has been Jim Jordan and MAGA Republicans feeding Trump. They're just feeding the beast with the insane hearings that they're holding all over the Capitol. That's why these three witnesses have been pulled out of the important work they do, is because Trump is not eating. This isn't Top Chef. This is the United States Congress. We were sent here to govern. We're not sent here to work every day on behalf of one person. He's not eating. And that's why you're here, to feed him. We're only here today because Chairman Jordan and his colleagues want to make a show of defending a former, failed, twice-impeached, crooked president.
Facts are supposed to influence action. Horrifying facts are supposed to elicit a response. Yet my Republican colleagues prefer gesturing about violent crime rather than doing something about it. The idea that this guy uh, is a Republican nominee to be speaker, a guy who aggressively agitated the activities that happened on January 6th, I think is disgusting. Jim Jordan is uh, not without political talent, as you can see from his astonishing run for speaker right now, but he is a mega extremist who um, is in direct contact with Donald Trump on a continuous, constant basis. He's anti-choice, he's anti-environment, um, and so it would basically cement the transformation of the Republican caucus into uh, a pro-Trump mega party. Mr. Speaker pro temp, Madam Clerk, colleagues, on behalf of the House Republican Conference, I rise today to nominate the gentleman from Ohio, Jim Jordan, as Speaker of the People's House. I am reminded of the Book of Esther. For such a time is this. Jim Jordan will be America's Speaker for such a time as this. Whether as Judiciary Chair, Conservative Leader, or Representative for his constituents in West Central Ohio, whether on the wrestling mat or in the committee room, Jim Jordan is strategic, scrappy, tough, and principled. He is a mentor, a worker, and above all, he is a fighter. And the American people know, we know, that Jim Jordan is a winner on behalf of the American people. We are here because the House has been thrown into chaos. We are here because this hallowed chamber has been led to a breaking point by two dangerous forces, extremism and partisanship. This body is debating elevating a speaker nominee who has not passed a single bill in 16 years. These are not the actions, these are not the actions of someone interested in governing or bettering the lives of everyday Americans. This is nothing less than the rejection of the oath that we swore to uphold as duly elected members of this body. He's had the courage to talk about a long-term plan and to get at the real drivers of debt. And we all know what they are. We all know it's Social Security. We all know it's Medicare. We all know it's Medicaid. No president of either side has been willing to deal with this. Now, my friend is not exactly a shrinking violet. You don't win the national championships in college. You don't come to this floor with a sincere set of beliefs and a desire to make a change uh, and be shy about it. 212 to 200. No amount of election denying is going to take away from those vote totals. The Speaker of the House must be a legislator. And the gentleman from Ohio falls short in that regard. He supports an extreme agenda and is hell-bent on banning abortion nationwide. Gutting Medicare, gutting Social Security, and giving cover to January 6th attackers. Those aren't the values that we share. The Honorable Jim Jordan of the state of Ohio has received 199. The Honorable Hakeem Jeffries of the state of New York has received 212. The chairman just reference in the face of continued obstruction. And, and I think it's quite rich that we are talking about subpoena compliance under a chairman of the full committee who was absolutely out of subpoena compliance in the last Congress. Uh, so we're going to haul witnesses in here today uh, and claim that they did not comply with subpoenas or requests. And that request is so rich because it's coming from a chairman who himself did not comply with the January 6th committee's request. So May 31, you see a letter sent to then Representative Jordan asking that he honor his subpoena. He was asked over and over and over, you were a witness to a crime. You were a witness to the greatest crime ever committed with the most criminals ever indicted in America. Will you help your country? Will you comply with that subpoena? No compliance, crickets absolute defiance of the subpoena. And because of that defiance, the chairman was referred, and it's still pending, to the House Ethics Committee. And why? Well, it's because he took an oath. And I want to have the congressional oath uh, put up there, but 
The congressional oath mandates that members of Congress defend the Constitution without any mental reservation, or as it says on the slide, purpose of evasion, not responding to a congressional subpoena, is a direct purpose of evasion. Mr. Chair, Mr. Jordan, would you like to me to yield to you, express your support for Mr. Gates' legislation I'm gonna, to- I'm gonna, yield to, I'm, gonna, I, I'm gonna yield to Mr. Gates. No, no, I, I'm God. yielding to you, Mr. Jordan. Well, I'm, gonna to let to me Mr. Know. I'm gonna listen to Mr. Gates' compelling Mr. Jordan, arguments Mr. Jordan, that I know will be Mr. coming, Jordan, and then we'll have a debate. Mr. Jordan, reclaiming my time, I, I'd be happy to yield to you for the purpose well, of- Well, I appreciate yes, your willingness. Uh, Mr. Jordan, if you'll let me finish. I will. It would abolish, it would eliminate the Bureau immediately after enactment. Do you support that, Mr. Jordan? Yes or no? I've given my answer. Do you support it? I've given my answer. Yes or no, Mr. Jordan? I've given my answer, Mr. Schiff. Okay, I guess your answer is you don't support it or, or you're afraid to say that you do. But I, I, I'm, hoping, uh, I'm happy to yield to Mr. Johnson or Mr. Biggs or Mr. McClintock, Mr. Tiffany, or Mr. Massey, anyone. Anyone else like to join Mr. Gates? And anyone, anyone, like to, uh, any, anyone like to express their support for Mr. Gates' effort to abolish an entire federal law enforcement agency? Anyone over there? I'm happy to yield to you for the purpose of saying yes or no whether you support Mr. Gates' efforts to defund the ATF. Do you, Mr. Jordan? I support Mr. Gates' effort to send a message to the ATF, which is what he said oh, so just you a few minutes support, ago in the you debate. you support the legislation to uh, defund the ATF? I didn't say that. Mr. I said Trump? I support his efforts to send a message well, the, to the, the ATF. Bill, the who, bill that Mr. Who, Gates has introduced changed the rule after 10 says, years of telling American citizens. that it would, it would abolish, it would eliminate the Bureau immediately after enactment. Do you support that, Mr. Jordan? Yes or no? Given my answer. I'm not getting a yes or no from anyone. I was getting to that. Well, yes I'm or sorry, no. I'm sorry, yes but no, Mr. Issa. I, you, what I was saying is yes that or no. it, it took 22 years to see y you yes or conducting no, a deposition of your colleagues, I, and I appreciate uh, it, reclaiming my time. Attorney. Reclaiming my time. Apparently, Mr. Gates is the only one willing to publicly say he supports defunding the ATF. Maybe that's progress, and, and I hope that will mean well, that, that my colleagues will I think there's going to be a vote. I think there's going to be a vote. I, I You're going to know here in a couple minutes. I hope minutes. that my colleagues will accept the amendment. Uh, the gentleman's time none has of them expired. Would, the gentleman from Arizona. Excuse me, I'm reclaiming my time, Mr. You don't have any time to reclaim. Well, I would if you hadn't been speaking over it. No, if you, you ask us all the questions. Well, and what's the answer, the Mr. Jordan? gentleman from Arizona. What's, what's the answer? Do you support, do you support abolishing the ATF, Mr. Jordan? The gentleman from Florida is recognized. They are now imposing on regular Americans a sense of zero tolerance that isn't for public safety. They're putting people out of business, like those who are contacting each of our offices who have some Scrivener's error or technical violation that oftentimes isn't even the fault of the individual that the ATF is bringing hellfire down on from a regulatory sense. So yes, I do believe that the current structure of the ATF is absolutely not worth vindicating or funding or continuing in its operational in, setting. In that case, would you yield, Mr. Gates? I'll yield, Mr. Schiff. Uh, Ms. Gates, can you identify any of your Republican colleagues on this committee who are supporting your bill? Well, I, I can identify one, and then I'll get back to my remarks. Mr. Biggs is a co-sponsor. I don't know if anybody else is. I'd invite your co-sponsors. Okay, so, 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 so there, so there are people here support. Look, we're going to so see in the vote. Two, two Republican members who favor abolishing the entire I, I, police I agency. Every the, I tell you what, you can get any, on the any other takers? format. I control the time. And you can get on and see that there's a handful of members who've co-sponsored the legislation. I would encourage everyone to do so because the ATF has been weaponized. Well, here we are, another partners meeting of Insurrection LLC. That's what this is. This is the newly formed largest law firm in Washington, D.C. Only has one client, maybe a second client that we're going to learn about today, but that client is former President Donald Trump. Their job is to litigate every one of his petty, petty, petty grievances. It's now 321 days since this subpoena was sent to Jim Jordan that he did not comply with. So it's comical that we are here today under Jim Jordan's leadership asking people why they don't want to comply with subpoenas. The guy won't comply with the one that was sent to him 321 days ago. Witness to a crime, the crime that has led to more arrests than any investigation in America. He's a witness being asked to do his patriotic duty and respond to a subpoena 321 days later refuses. Also, since the last hearing of this Committee to Obstruct Justice, Chairman Jordan is now interfering in an independent criminal prosecution. There's an investigation in Manhattan, also in Atlanta, also at the Department of Justice, into the former president. 
And Jim Jordan has sent a letter to the independently elected district attorney, Alvin Bragg of Manhattan. He is asking Alvin Bragg to commit a felony. Why is he asking Alvin Bragg to commit a felony? To help Donald Trump. Why is it a felony? Because if Alvin Bragg were to turn over what Jim Jordan is asking, Alvin Bragg would be violating New York law that says you cannot turn over grand jury proceedings. But that's what they're asking him to do. Again, the law doesn't matter if your client is Donald Trump. Again, I'm gonna leave this up here in probably 200 font so Mr. Jordan doesn't need his glasses to read it. The same individual who posted this also posted this photo. There you go, Donald Trump, real tough guy, holding a baseball bat next to a picture of that independent prosecutor that Jim Jordan wants to commit a felony, Alvin Bragg. But you won't hear from this committee to obstruct justice any condemnation of what Donald Trump posted. They can't condemn him. They can't. So, in their silence, they condone it. And in these posts from Donald Trump, he incites more and more Americans to commit violence, like a woman who was arrested yesterday near Times Square with a knife, seeking to carry out an act of violence in Donald Trump's name. There's no credibility. Uh, there's no credibility on Jim Jordan's committee to obstruct justice. He can't talk credibly about witnesses not complying with subpoenas, and that's why he's not here. <laughs> he wasn't at the last hearing. He often goes to subcommittee hearings. This is one of the only ones he doesn't go to. It's because there's no credibility. You can't ask people to comply. You can't complain when people don't comply when you are 321 days into your own non-compliance. Just doesn't work. So he, he won't come here. He'll ask my friend, Mr. Klein here, who's doing his best job uh, to represent Mr. Jordan, to do that instead. But Mr. Jordan won't come here. Mr. Jordan will pull the old, I don't have my reading glasses trick when he's asked if he will condemn a threat of death and destruction by the former president. As Mr. Ivey pointed out, more kids will be victims of gun violence and the committee that can do something about it will focus on this nonsense. But I know where Mr. Ivey and I are on the issue of gun violence. We're going to continue to stand up to protect kids. It's clear that the, these guys are only here to protect Trump, and I yield back. Mr. Attorney General, my colleague just said that you should be held in contempt of Congress, and that is quite rich, because the guy who's leaving the hearing room right now, Mr. Jordan, is about 500 days into evading his subpoena. About 500 days. So if we're going to talk about contempt of Congress, let's get real. There's no credibility on that side. Mr. Attorney General, you are serious, they are not. You are decent, they are not. You are fair, they are not. So I welcome you to the law firm of Insurrection LLP, where they work every single day on behalf of one client, Donald Trump. And they do that at the expense of millions of Americans who need the government to stay open, who want their kids safe in their schools, and would like to see Ukraine stay in the fight so that we don't help Russia. That's the expense that this nonsense, this clown show, I'd call it a clown show, except they actually have real responsibilities that affect real Americans. It's the difference between one side that believes in governing and one side that believes in ruling. You've tried to comply with this committee. In fact, last week, one of your special agents came here for an interview, brought his lawyer, and was told that he couldn't have his lawyer present. Mr. Jordan, who tells all of us he knows so much about the Constitution, wouldn't afford one of your employees one of the basic constitutional rights to have a lawyer present. In fact, they threatened to call the Capitol Police and arrest a lawyer that was brought. Are you familiar with that standoff that occurred last week, Mr. Attorney General? Uh, generally, yes. Well, your office also sent a letter detailing it that you were willing to comply, but you'd like him to have a lawyer, and I'd like to submit that to the record with unanimous consent. Without objection. Who appointed Mr. Weiss. Well, Mr. Trump was the last person who appointed Mr. Weiss to the position of U.S. Attorney. I appointed him to the position of Special Counsel last month. Who initially appointed John Durham? Mr. Durham was, I believe, also appointed by President Trump. Um, and uh, Mr. Barr appointed him as Special Counsel. And again, these guys are so upset that Donald Trump's appointed prosecutors aren't doing enough 
of the corruption that Donald Trump wants them to do. So either they are just following the law or they're not as corrupt and they're not willing to go as far as they think that Donald Trump deserves. That's what they're asking to happen here. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California for five minutes. Ms. Burdett, you are an expert on anti-Semitism, and I want to read a few uh, different statements to you, and if you can just give me a yes or no as to whether you would consider them anti-Semitic. I prefer my kids' new Hanukkah from Kwanzaa. At least it will come with some financial engineering. Anti-Semitic or not? Very potentially. I just think that's what they're about, is making money, in a reference to Jared Kushner and his Jewish family. You think that's anti-Semitic? Anti-Jewish stereotype. Planned Parenthood was made by Margaret Sanger, a known eugenics with the KKK to control the Jew population. When I say Jew, I mean the 12 lost tribes of Judah, the blood of Christ, who the people known as the race black really are. This is who our people are. Anti-Semitic or not? A little too confusing for me to decipher. We'll get to that. <laughs> this ain't a game. I'm gonna use you as an example to show you the Jewish people that told you to call me that no one can threaten or influence me. I told you this is war. Now gonna get you some business. Still confusing? Uh, uses two stereotypes um, about Jews as being motivated only by business and having nefarious <coughs> control uh, that isn't real. Last one. I'm a bit sleepy tonight, but when I wake up, I'm going death con three on Jewish people. The funny thing is, I actually can't be anti-Semitic because black people are actually Jew. Also, you guys have toyed with me and tried to blackball anyone who opposes your agenda. What do you think about that one? Anti-Semitic. Yeah. So what I'm concerned about is that we have anti-Semitic posts coming from this committee. And last October, the chairman tweeted out on October 6, Kanye Elon Trump. Those five statements that I just read to you were from Kanye West, who had made a number of anti-Semitic statements before this tweet was put up, and then made the death con statement about a day after the tweet was put up. Mr. Chairman, I want to be just today your accountability partner, your online accountability partner, and just go through your social media. Because if we're going to have a hearing about anti-Semitism, we can't allow a tweet like this to be posted on our side or your side. In 2019, Chairman Jordan also tweeted at Tom Steyer and used the dollar sign for Steyer to spell his name. Again, known Jewish philanthropist playing into what Ms. Burdett mentioned earlier, tropes about Jewish people and money. You're hurting a lot of people by keeping that tweet up for so long, especially knowing what it represents. And if we're talking about being your online accountability partner, Chairman, you still have a subpoena in your inbox that's about 500 days old. And uh, with that, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock. Uh, uh, first, does the chairman wish to dignify that with a response? No, I don't. Yield time. I don't. And Jim Jordan, who has assembled this hearing today, and the other MAGA Republicans are just working every day as Trump's chef. And then there's the comical hypocrisy that Jim Jordan would convene a hearing around anyone's subpoena compliance. You see, we are now 567 days, 19 hours, 12 minutes, and 35 seconds into Jim Jordan refusing to comply with the subpoena for his involvement in January 6, an attack on the Capitol. And you would think that a member of Congress who has sworn an oath to defend the Constitution would want to help their government in the largest investigation the country has ever taken. The largest investigation with the most indictments, the most witnesses, the most trials around a single event. The chairman of this committee, who's got a problem with the subpoena compliance, and we're going to talk about the overcompliance that we've seen from your agencies. It's just comical that he would call a hearing to complain about you complying with subpoenas when he 567 days in, won't even comply with the zone. And these claims, it's clear that what Republicans want to do to impeach Joe Biden is not working. They can't draw the straight line between what they think Hunter Biden did and what they want Joe Biden to have done. They may prove at the end of this Congress that Hunter Biden is Joe Biden's son. 
that may be coming, but they have not proved anything else, and so they're trying to draw the foul. They're gonna ask for dozens, hundreds, thousands of documents, and they're gonna hope that you're not gonna to respond to one of them, so now they have an obstruction of justice case to use as the predicate for impeachment. I also wanna talk about the transcribed interviews because you all have sent to this committee 92 individuals to be a part of transcribed private interviews. Not for the public to observe, but 92 private transcribed interviews. Take a guess at how many of those interviews have resulted in a public hearing. It's zero. It is all theater. It is all to feed the beast because Donald Trump's not eating. So they have to haul these people in. They learn in private that there is no wrongdoing. And so we never hear about it in public. Finally, the center of so many of these investigations has been the current president's son. And you would think after a year of hearings about the current president's son and the indictments against the current president's son and the prosecutors involved in the case of the current president's son and the private transcribed interviews around the current president's son that you would see the Republicans bring in for a public hearing the president's son. And so what happened this week? The Republicans subpoena Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden says, great, I'll come in. I'll testify publicly. And Jim Jordan and James Comer, they can't take yes for an answer. They don't want him to testify publicly. And it's for the same reason that the other 92 witnesses have never come in. It is all to just feed the beast, to keep Donald Trump happy. So welcome to a post Thanksgiving meal to feed Donald Trump. And I introduce to you the chefs led by top chef Jim Jordan and chef boy McCarthy who went down to Mar-a-Lago and their effort to keep Donald Trump happy. I yield back.